One, two, test, test, one, two, test. Greetings in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Good morning. Good morning. If we've never met yet, I am Pastor Joni Schilling. It's my joy to welcome you on behalf of this worship team and this church family. If you are worshiping with us online, we're so glad that you are with us, and we invite you to let us know that you are here by filling out the connection card. There are worship hosts that can take your prayer concerns um, or answer any questions that you might have. Today we begin a new series entitled A Relationship with the Holy Spirit, the third and often neglected person of the Trinity. Drawing on what the Bible says regarding the person and work of the Holy Spirit, this series is focused on how to encourage us to know the Holy Spirit better. Today's message is entitled, You've Got a Friend. Throughout this series, Leading up to Pentecost, we will begin our worship with the singing of one of the doxologies of the Christian church called the Gloria Patri, as it celebrates the three persons of the Trinity. The Gloria Patri is a short hymn of praise to bring glory or praise to God the Father. Following the Gloria Patri, I will pray our prayer of invocation each Sunday in unity with other area churches who will be praying this same prayer. So we invite you now to stand as we sing the Gloria Patre and move towards our opening hymn. As 
love for us, O oh God. We surrender our lives to you today. Awaken us to your presence and to your truth. Give us a hunger and a thirst to know you and to love you with all our hearts. Holy Spirit, come close to us and fill us with your power. We are desperate to see your purpose here on earth. Revive us again. In Jesus' name, amen. And now we'll join together in singing our opening hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. morning's children's message is for our children online and the child in all of us. And when Jesus was on earth, he faced a lot of pressure. He was disliked by many and faced hardship because he, because he claimed to be the son of God. Life piled many hardships on him. But Jesus was able to face those things because he was Jesus. He had God's strength to sustain him. We face many of those same pressures and hardships in our life today. But we, unlike Jesus, are more like this piece of paper. We face those same pressures and hardships, but when they are put on us, well, it just doesn't work the same. We are unable to handle them the same way that he was. We crumble, we fall, and we cannot handle them on our own. But if we wrap ourselves around Jesus, Jesus who is no longer here in the form of the Holy Spirit, 
who strengthens and guides us, we have a different lot. We, all of a sudden, have the ability to take a different shape and handle those things. Because now, all of a sudden, we do have the strength to handle the same things that Jesus faced because we have the same power that Jesus had through the power of the Holy Spirit. The difference between us on our own and us with the Holy Spirit is my unsteady hand, <laughs> is the difference between us on our own and us with the Holy Spirit is that we have the power and the strength that Jesus had. Alone we are unable, but with the Holy Spirit we are able. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you pray with me? Dear God, thank you for the Holy Spirit, the one who gives strength and leads and guides. Help us to remember that on our own we are weak, but with the strength of the Holy Spirit all things are possible. It's in your holy name that we pray. And all of God's children said, Amen. And now as we get ready for our prayer we'll join together in singing sweet sweet spirit there's a sweet sweet spirit in this place and I Spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face, and I know they feel the presence of the Advocate, Counselor, Comforter, Spirit of Truth, you are all these things for us and more. We praise you, O oh God, for your divine plan to dwell with us and in us, and you provide all that we need to persevere through the ups and downs of life on this side of eternity. We confess our lack of understanding and study of your nature as Trinity, three persons in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we confess that it is easier to focus on you as creator and you as our savior who walked among us in human flesh so many centuries ago. But your word calls us to understand you in all of your fullness and to trust and believe that you are spirit with us in us and working through us. Holy Spirit of God, pour out your comfort to all whose hearts are breaking due to losses of various kinds. Through death, brokenness, separation. Comfort all who cry out to you as they are battling depression, anxiety, addiction, and other illnesses of the mind and emotions. Comfort those who are suffering physical Ill illness, those facing surgeries, and those whose aging bodies 
betray them. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray all of this and the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Joni. Good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Russ Titchener, and I'm honored to be one of the pastors here at Mommy United Methodist Church. And uh, it has been a, uh, a wonderful but busy week uh, doing lots of different things. This week we had uh, uh, our secretary, Cindy, out. She had some surgery this week and is doing well, and we'll be back on Monday. Uh, but while she was out, we had some saints of the Lord come in and, and uh, fill the spot, even though no one can truly fill Cindy's shoes. I hope you're watching today, Cindy. And, uh, but we had some saints of the Lord, Debbie Mills and Gwen Drown and Di Diana Couts uh, that came in and, and filled in, tried to live up to her, uh, her high level of performance. Uh, this past Thursday, when Diana was leaving, uh, she came down at the end of the hallway. If you haven't been in our offices, uh, Pastor Joni and I and, and are at the end of the hallway, and, and the staff's kind of between us. And, and so Diana took off down the hallway and checked with both Pastor Joni and I to see if we needed anything before she left. And she turned around and was walking back down the hallway, and I heard this voice. It was Zach Phillips, our youth pastor, who said, uh, No, I'm fine. I don't need anything, right? <laughs> Well, obviously, Diana did not realize that Zach was back there or she would have gone over there, but, but we laughed. We thought it was funny. I couldn't figure out if Joni was the father or the son because obviously we had forgotten the Holy Spirit, right? <laughs> and I thought, you know, I can use this on Sunday morning because that's oftentimes what we do. We give top billing to the father and, and top billing to the son, and yet oftentimes we overlook, we overlook the Holy Spirit. And so, as Pastor Joni said, this morning we're going to try to do something about that and, uh, and to uh, spend some time over the next five weeks focusing, focusing on uh, what is our relationship with the Holy Spirit look like, what should it look like, what can we expect it to look like, and we'll, we'll spend some time doing that. So let's take a moment, let's pray, and then I'll move into the sermon. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We thank you for your love and for your direction and for your guidance and for your celebration of joy in our lives. Lord, I had a discussion yesterday on the subject of hope. You indeed are our hope. And so, Holy Spirit, bless us this morning as we, as we give you your due and we talk about you and we worship you and we adore you and we love you. Lord, bless us today. We pray all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. You know, if we were to look up different definitions on the... Uh, of the word relationship, Webster uh, would say something like this. He would say, relationships are the way two or more people are connected. Or that state of, of being connected. The relationships are that state of being connected. We see the truth of that definition, I think, oftentimes played out in, as we introduce people uh, to other people that we, that we meet along the way. Let's say I'm in the grocery store and I'm uh, with a buddy who, let's say his name's Bob, and he's on the bowling team. And, and me and Bob were walking through the, the grocery store, and we bump into uh, uh, a member of our church here at Mommy United Methodist Church. We bump into Betty. And I see Betty, and I say, Betty, how you doing? Good to see you. And I say, Bob, this is Betty. She's a member of our church. And Betty, this is Bob. He's a, he's a member of my bowling team. And so we establish that relationship with each other through a connection. Betty being the member of our church and Bob being the member of our bowling team. And, and so both parties know, oh, that's how you're connected in relationship then to, to Russ. 
And yet, oftentimes, we start to look at that relationship uh, that, that, that we're connected through, uh, and, and sometimes we start to understand that, that certain connections are greater than others. And so if I were walking through the grocery store with Bob and I see Betty and I say, hey, Betty, come here. I want to introduce you to somebody. And I say, Betty, this is, my, this is Bob, my son. And I say, Bob, this is, this is my friend Betty. She goes to our church. Well, probably Betty, the first time, if it was my bowling teammate, she might go, hi, hi, nice to meet you. But if I say, Betty, this is Bob, my son, she would probably go, oh, Bob, it's so nice to meet you, right? Because the connection between my son would be perceived probably higher than the connection that I had with someone that was, that was, on, my, was on my bowling team. You know, when it comes to our understanding of the Trinity, our understanding of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I think, I think sometimes we can do that, that same thing. We establish in our minds who is the most important based on our understanding of, of our human relationship. I mean, surely we should respect or, or pay more honor to a father than we would to a son. You know, I was in youth ministry at, at Loveland United Methodist Church. I can remember one year we had, in the middle of, of confirmation season, and one of the things that we would always, as Zach does, one of the things we would always look at in confirmation was uh, the understanding of the Trinity. Uh, and explain that to the students. And, and I'd always encourage uh, parents, I'd send home homework for the parents also, and they could do that with their, with their students. And, and so the, the, the parents were getting the same lessons that the students were getting, and they were talking about those lessons. And, and I can remember that after the, the, the uh, lesson on the Trinity, I had a, a father pulled me aside after church one day, and he was talking to me about, about the, uh, the importance of, of the father in, in the Trinity. I said, yes, the, the Father is very important in the Trinity, just like Jesus is, is important and, and the Holy Spirit is important. And he says, yes, Jesus is important, but, but Jesus isn't the Father. I said, you're right. But Jesus is fully God, just as much as the Father is fully God and just as much as the Spirit is fully God. You see, while our connections to others may create a, a pecking order in our relationships here on earth that is not true when it comes to understanding the relationship of God. Pastor Tim Keller describes the relationships found in the Trinity this way. He says, in self-centeredness, we demand that others orbit around us. We will do things and give affection to others as long as it helps us meet our personal goals and fulfills us. But the inner life of the triune God is, is utterly different. The life of the Trinity is characterized not by, not by self-centeredness, but by mutually self-giving love. Each of the divine persons centers upon the other. None demands that the others revolve around him. Each voluntarily circles the other too pouring out love and delight and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity loves and adores, defers to, and rejoices in others, in the others, creating then this dance of, of joy and love. Theologian Urgen uh, uh, Moltmann says this, he says, he says the three persons, the three divine persons, are not simply for themselves. They are there for one another. They are persons in a social relationship. The father can be called the father only in relationship with the son. And the son can be called the son only in relationship with the father. The spirit is the breath of the one who speaks. And so the Trinity is the relationship, the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, a relationship that allows for mutual submission where no one is diminished. 
And so as a result, we see Jesus in submission to the Father. In John 12, 49, picking up, it says this. It says, I don't speak on my own authority. The Father who sent me has commanded me what to say and how to say it. I know his commands lead to eternal life. So I say whatever the Father tells me to say. And again, we see the Spirit in submission, in submission to the Son. In John 16, 12, picking up there, it says this. It says, there is, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, there is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you, he will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. Yes, God through the Trinity demonstrates to us how, how through mutually self-giving love, no one in the Trinity is, is diminished. Jesus' is dimin Jesus is divinity is not diminished because he is the Son, nor because of his submission to the Father, and neither is the Holy Spirit's divinity diminished because he is the Spirit, nor because he, he is in submission to the Son. No, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three persons, fully divine, fully God, fully worthy of all three top billing in our lives, fully worthy of our love, fully worthy of our worship, fully worthy of our praise, fully, worship, fully worthy of, of our attention. You know, the activity of the Holy Spirit, if you were to look back in Scripture, it is found throughout uh, Scripture, both in the Old and New Testaments. Uh, and yet what we find in the Old Testament is different than what we find in the New Testament. When we see the activity of the, the Spirit in people's lives in the, the Old Testament, it is oftentimes as a result of a specific purpose or a person that God needs to use in that space. For instance, Moses is, is, filled, is filled with the Spirit for, for the purpose of, of leading God's people to freedom. Or the 70 elders who were with Moses to help him governor, govern are, are filled with the Spirit for the purpose of, of giving them wisdom so that they will be able to govern. And I can never say this name. I don't even know why I put it in here. I thought I should just take that name out because you would never know if I didn't, right? Ready? Bezulal. I can never say that name, Bazulel. You know who Bazulel was? He was the guy, right, that was the craftsman for the temple in, or for the tabernacle in the desert. They needed an artisan. They needed a craftsman that, could, that can direct all the things. So the Holy Spirit came on and filled him with the Spirit. Or God filled him with the Spirit. And he became the craftsman that directed all the construction of the temple. Bezulel. Bezulel. Lord, forgive me. Holy Spirit, give me the power to say his name. Or Gideon, or Samson, or King Saul, or King David. All given the Spirit of God for a specific purpose. And yet when God's purposes were completed, or when someone would grieve the, the Holy Spirit by, by doing something unfaithful, then, then the Spirit was removed from that person. We see that with King Saul or Samson through their unfaithfulness, and the spirit then is removed from their person. Right? That was King David's fear when, when he sinned with Bathsheba. Right? In response to that fear, David prays that prayer in, in Psalm 51, do not cast me from your presence or, or take your Holy Spirit from me. And yet the good news is that Jesus at the Last Supper promises that through the new covenant, that his followers, followers will have a new relationship with the Holy Spirit in their lives. In the 14th chapter of John, Jesus, the Last Supper, announces once again that, to his disciples that he will be leaving. And in the midst of their anxiety, and in the midst of their, in their, of their fear, and in the midst of their sorrow, Jesus starts to unfold for them at that supper what, what God is doing in their midst. And after finishing the meal, Jesus tells his disciples not to let his leaving throw them for a loop. But rather he challenges them by saying, you, you trust God, don't you? Well, then trust me. 
And then after assuring his disciples that he was going away for a purpose to prepare a place for them and that he would eventually come back to them so that they, they could be where he was going to be, he picks up in John 14, 16 by telling them this. He says, and furthermore, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now in the person of Jesus and later will be in you. But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. Now, the word Jesus uses to describe the Holy Spirit in this passage is is, uh, the Greek word paraclete. And it is translated many different ways. In the New Living Translation that we saw today, it is translated as, as Advocate. And yet the word is translated in so many different ways because it's really hard to translate because it has, in the Greek, so many different nuances. And so you will see this word in different versions of the Bible being translated as, as we heard some of Pastor Joni say this morning, comforter, counselor, helper, helper, intercessor, today, advocate, strengthener, encourager, mediator, or even as the word standby, as one who would come along and stand by us and be there for us. You know, when I worked at CVS drugstores, every, like every other year we would have these expos and, uh, and we would have them in the, the major markets where we had stores. And so in, in this area, we might either have an expo in, uh, sorry, Toledo probably wouldn't cut it. It would have to be probably Cleveland or, or Columbus or Cincinnati. We'd have them in the, in the bigger cities. And, and the expos uh, would usually last three days, usually Friday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And they would be health expos where like 50,000 people would show up a day. Uh, and then we would have like health clinics and health screenings all free. We would have uh, gifts giveaways. We'd have all sorts of samples uh, that you could get for free. Uh, you would have um, free clinics. Uh, you would have famous people coming. Um, uh, you would have uh, uh, like sports legends or movie stars or, or soap operas. Uh, who was the guy? Who was the guy? Uh, Black. His last name was Black. He was, a, he was a soap opera star. Anybody remember him? Several years ago. I had no idea who he was. Man, I was like next to him, and I almost got ran over by this mob when he came out, right? So, so really, sometimes really popular people. But my favorite person of all of that was uh, Muhammad Ali, and I had met him a couple of times because he had been to a couple of our, of our uh, legends, sports legends, uh, had come. And, and whoever comes, whether it's a movie star or a, a soap opera star or a legend, uh, one of the legends, and it could be an active legend uh, playing sports, uh, they were given a contract and they had to sign an agreement that they would stay out front at a table signing autographs for 30 minutes, which meant that they might stay out there for 15 or 20 minutes if you were lucky, and then they would be off on their way, right? Except, always except for Muhammad Ali, who would sit down with his Parkinson and would start to sign autograph after autograph after autograph after autograph until every single last person was done talking to him sometimes taking two and three hours to get through that. I can remember in Cleveland, when we were in Cleveland, uh, he was getting up to leave, and he looked exhausted. I said, man, I can't, I was talking to the people who were with us, I can't believe that he would spend so long, much time doing this. And he said, he's, he's leaving here to go to a prison. He'll spend a couple of hours with inmates at the local prison before he goes back home. You know, Muhammad Ali was probably the most famous professional boxer of all time. And yet the person who made... Ali float like a butterfly and sting like a bee was a man by the name of Angelo Dundee who for two decades was in Ali's corner. Literally, he was Ali's corner man, his coach, his trainer. Dundee not only trained Ali, but but he also trained 15 15 other world champions. And when asked by a reporter to describe his his job as a corner man, Dundee says, when you're, when you're working with the fighter in the corner, you're, you're the fighter's surgeon patching him back up. And you're the fighter's engineer telling him how to swing and how to dodge and how to miss and how to connect. And you're in the fighter's head because you're his psychologist, making sure he stays focused on the goal. 
In the same way, God gives us a, a corner man in the Holy Spirit, if you will, who is in the battle with us, shouting out encouragement, strengthening us with power beyond ourselves, supporting us with, with, with comfort when we are hurt and, and conviction when we are on the wrong path, interceding when we are, are too weak to go on by on our own, and always, 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 always standing by us, living in us to sustain us and support us. Jesus tells his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. In other words, Jesus is one advocate and I'm going to give you through the Father another advocate. Another stand by her, another stand by your side person who will never, never, never leave. Eugene Peterson in the message simply wraps all of those holy characteristics up by, by translating the passage, I will talk to the Father, and he'll provide for you another friend. So you will always have someone with you. Yes, the promise that, that comes with the new covenant is the gift of the, the Holy Spirit, who 50 days after the resurrection on the day of Pentecost arrives on the scene in this powerful way as these, these tongues of fire start to fall upon the disciples and start to be sealed in their heart of hearts with the Spirit, who takes up his residence not with the disciples but in the disciples, creating a holy of holies within each of their hearts. The Apostle Paul says it this way in Ephesians 1, 13. He says this. He says, and now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, who promised long ago, who he promised long ago, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised that everlasting life, and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise, so that we would praise and glorify him. You know, growing a friendship takes work and takes time. I mean, you just don't suddenly meet someone and suddenly become their best friend. Anyway, that's not been my experience. I go, hi, how you doing? And it's like, whoa. You know, but isn't that true, right? Isn't that true? One of my best friends, I can remember when I first met him, I met him at church, and I thought, he's kind of goofy, me speaking, right? Yeah. And then I remember being in one of the stores uh, when I was uh, working for CVS, and, and he came in one day, it was at the mall, it was at Kenwood Town Center, and, and he was getting a Coke, and he came over and talked to me, and, and he left, and I thought, I am, I'm guaranteeing that guy is weird, you know? <laughs> and today he's one of my best friends, right? Life blood friends, right? Forever friends, right? It takes time and it takes work. And even though God seals us with his spirit, and even though his spirit takes up residence in our hearts, the very moment that we place our trust in Jesus, at that very moment the spirit comes and lives within us, it takes time to get to know him. We just take time to learn what, what the other person is like. Learn their preferences. Learn what they like and what they don't like. Friendships are, are built on mutual respect and, and trust that will eventually give birth to love. I mean, when I look at the great friendships of my life, when I look at my friendship with my wife, Michelle, when I look at my friendship with that person I just mentioned, Don, when I look at my friendship with my accountability partner, Bill, it is that mutual, mutual respect and trust that gave birth to love in my life towards them. I called my Bill this past, my Bill, <laughs> he is my Bill. I called my friend Bill this past Thursday because I had not talked to him for like seven weeks. Now, normally, that's not a big deal, right? They're kind of like family, right? You haven't talked to them in a month. You go, hey, how you doing? Fine. You know, haven't talked to them too much. How you doing? Fine. Normally, that's not a big deal. But this time, it was a big deal because Mary, his wife, is undergoing treatment for, for breast cancer. And I'd been doing pretty good uh, 
up until these last seven weeks. And I got busy, and we got, you know, the move, and the church, and, you know, all the stuff. And I can make a thousand different excuses, right? Just got busy. And during those seven weeks, I knew that Mary was going to have her surgery, and she did have her surgery and had a double mastectomy. She had gotten the results back from her lymph node. She had already had previous to her surgery uh, uh, chemo and radiation. And so they were hoping that the lymph nodes would show no cancer, but in fact, the lymph nodes did show cancer. And for the last five weeks after the surgery, she has drain tubes in that are longer than normal. And so it's been, it's been um, a challenging time for Bill and for Mary. So I apologize for not being there for Bill. I sent some flowers to Mary. Let her know that we were praying for her, because we are. In other words, I needed to confess and repent and change my behavior towards my friend. And through it all, Bill received me with grace and mercy and forgiveness because he loves me. That's what friends do. You see, our friendship with the Holy Spirit must look the same. And so we, when we do something that hurts our friend, when we sin, we should go back and, and confess and apologize and repent. And there should be perhaps tears in our eyes because I know I've hurt his feelings. And I don't want to hurt his feelings because I love him. And yet I know I'll hurt his feelings again. And yet, just like my friend Bill, the Holy Spirit will meet us each and every time with grace and mercy and forgiveness and unconditional love. Yes, the Holy Spirit is a friend who will teach us and guide us and lead us. He will guide us away from, in, from sin and those things in our lives that are harmful and guide us to those places that affirm us and build us up and bring joy into our lives. The Spirit will, will pour his love and affection into our lives and remind us over and over again that, that we are the apple of his eye, that we are precious in his sight. That we are the focus of his attention, and then he is hoping, hope beyond hope, that we are the that he is the focus of ours. And because he is our friend, he will celebrate with us, and he will laugh with us, and he will cry with us, and he will mourn with us, and he will pray with us. And he will pray for us. Why? Because he loves us. Because he's our friend. Will you pray with me? Spirit of the living God Fall fresh on me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit. you please stand we're going to join together in our song of response spirit of god descend upon my heart
Stoop to my weakness, mighty as Thou art, and make me love Thee as I ought to love. Teach me to feel that Thou art struggles of the soul to bear, to check the rising doubt, the rebel sigh, teach me the patience of thine angels love one holy passion filling all my frame the kindling of the heaven descended God's blessings abound, amen? amen? And we must respond, we must give our thanks to God, and one of the ways we do that is by being a part of the active work that God is doing through his church. And so if you would choose to give to God's work through this particular church family, we invite you to do so in one of the following ways, either by uh, putting an offering in the baskets as you leave this place. Uh, online you can go to the giving tab or to the church website, or you can simply mail or bring in your contribution. We, when you arrive today, you receive this card. So we are in this season after Easter called Easter Tide, and it, it is the season of a church year that um, continues until the day of Pentecost. And this year, for our Pentecost celebration, we are co combining with other churches in Perrysburg and um, South Toledo for a special event, um, a spirit and truth event, where we will have guests come in to help lead us and draw us near to our Lord and to receive the Holy Spirit more powerfully into our church life. So it's a week of unity, healing, and renewal. Um, this is happening May 23rd through the 25th. On the back is a prayer that is the personalized version of the prayer we are going to be praying each week here in worship throughout this season, Easter season, um, up until our Pentecost celebration. So we invite you to be a part of this and what God is doing in our midst in a world so desperately in need of the hope of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit to mold us and shape us and to overcome the obstacles we face. Let us all be a part of this very prayerfully. If you would like um, to study the Holy Spirit in a, in a deeper way, you know, it's, it's, it can get rather complicated, can't it? This understanding of God and three persons. You know, God is beyond our comprehension. We just have to face that. <laughs> I think this understanding of God as the Holy, as the Trinity just helps us to better understand the fullness of God. And so um, perhaps you are like myself who didn't grow up focusing much on um, the third person of the Trinity. And so we are offering a book and a couple of small groups um, based on the book The Forgotten God by Francis Chan. So if you'd like to be a part of that, please contact Rachel Barkholtz to either receive a book to read on your own or to be a part of one of our small groups. 
as we continue uh, to stay healthy and fight the spread of COVID, um, we invite you to remain seated until one of the ushers dismiss you so we can spread out as we, as we leave. So now receive this benediction. As you go forth today, be reminded that God is the creator of this beautiful universe. And that God is also the son who walked in human flesh on this earth and saves us from our sins and paves the way for our eternal future. And God is that friend who is in our corner, who walks with us wherever we go. And we can know that as we leave this place, the Holy Spirit of God goes with us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Amen.